Do you feel that in a time when we are more connected than ever, we are drifting away from real human connections, especially to ourselves? I do. Hi, I'm Leticia Latino, and I want to invite you to join me and my very inspiring guests in exploring ways to reconnect to your essence, to your definite purpose, to what makes you tick. Are you ready? Hello and welcome to a new episode of Back to Basics, Reconnecting to the Essence of You. I always get excited when I'm able to get on the show women that inspire me both professionally and personally. Although we met briefly a few months back when we both flew to D.C. to help the National Association of Tower Erectors support very important legislation on workforce development, I feel I have known Miranda Allen for a while. Once I learned that not only she is the CEO of RSI, which is a health and safety RF radiation compliance firm, but she's also a trainer, an author, keynote speaker, a mom of four, and most importantly, and among many other incredible things, she's a cancer survivor. Miranda, it's an honor to have you on Back to Basics. Welcome. Thank you. This is very exciting. I love it. Well, you know, when we first met and uh, we are sitting at the, at the Senate cafeteria, right? That's where we were sitting That's uh, right. during lunch. It was pretty surreal that we got to go through that experience. I don't know if it was the first for you, but it was a first for me. Um, you know, and you're talking to so many inspiring people. It just felt for me it was like uh, a surreal day. It was. It was amazing. Yeah. And and then, you know, to hear you talk about what you do professionally and your life in Kansas, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. And, uh, you know, I know what stuck with me is you told me that there's how many people in the town you live in now? Less than a thousand people in the community that I live in. So it's very small. Uh, That's that shocked me. And then that you have some uh, interesting pet. I do. I actually have a peacock. Well, actually, he's gone now, but we uh, had two peacocks. And so that was kind of interesting in our backyard in Kiowa. So it was all fun. <laughs> so, yeah, coming from Miami, you know, where I mean, you don't see peacocks, but that, but also we are not a community of a thousand people that just stuck with me. And we had such a an empowering conversation. And then through work, we are getting to also do other exciting things together now. But uh, I definitely, um, when I learned that you were a cancer survivor and a little bit of your story, I say she, I hope she says yes to coming on my podcast because I know your story is going to inspire a lot of people out there. Well, I thank you for having me. And this is so much fun. I love to do this type of thing. And I'm an open book. I have had a lot of different experiences in my life. And if I can help someone through those experiences that I've had, I'm here. So definitely anybody that's listening can reach out and I would love to have a sidebar conversation too. Oh, great, Miranda. And so tell me, I mean, did you, were you born in Kansas? Tell us about uh, your early years, your childhood, your family. Um, I was actually born in Oklahoma, right on the Oklahoma-Kansas border. I am the oldest of three. I have two younger brothers, and we lived in a small community until I was about a kindergartner. At that point, my parents moved us to Houston, and we were living in Houston until I was 13. It was very a large community, of course. I I think I had 2,700 in my uh, seventh grade class. And about that time when I was a seventh grader, my parents decided that uh, we needed to move back to rural Kansas where they both had grown up. My dad was traveling quite a bit for his career and my mom has her family here. So I got moved back to a town of less than a thousand people. Uh, We have no stoplights. We have uh, two eating establishments and a gas station and a small grocery store. So moving back here was definitely a culture shock. And as a 13 year old, um, I really wasn't sure about this place and I couldn't wait to leave. I didn't like it. Everybody was in my business was involved. Uh, You know, they say it takes a village. Well, 
everybody was a village around here. And so (laughs) I could not wait to leave. And I graduated uh, actually a year early from high school because I was ready to go. (laughs) That's a good incentive. Exactly. (laughs) I'm like, I got to get my life started. Get me out of here. And so I left the town for about 10 years and um, put a whole uh, stop in there. What you graduated from? Well, I actually went to a small liberal arts college in Oklahoma, and I started off in accounting, which I soon found out that I am not an accountant. I like numbers, but I'm a people person. I am a socializer. So I tried to change my major to marketing, but they didn't have that major when I, (laughs) at the (laughs) college I went to. So I ended up with a bachelor's of arts in public relations, which was interesting, you know, because I did radio and television and uh, newspaper as, as part of that curriculum. And so it was a little bit different take on the normal marketing aspect. Okay, that's great. And the reason why I always ask this is because I try to establish a link between the traits that we have as children, as child, when we were growing up and things we enjoyed to do. And, and surprisingly enough, how society, how the, the standards take us into careers that really are not what excite us. And, and so yes. the people that come on this show are usually people that had a, a change of heart at some point in their lives and they realize and took control and say, yeah, I did some accounting, but then I realized I'm a, I'm a people's person. So now it sounds to me that at some point you had that realization and you corrected your course. I did. And I, I, it was early on, but you know, the funny thing is, is I still, people talk about, I have a 16 year old son, so he's a sophomore we're looking at career planning and what he wants to do. And I'm sitting here thinking I'm 41 and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I, I I love a variety of things. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting because we do push children in at such an early age to come up with a career path. And yet I'm still trying to figure it out. And I have a variety of different things that I do. And like I said, being on this is an opportunity for me to do something that I'm passionate about. Um, But it's so hard to say, I I wasn't one of those children that said, when I grew up, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. It was, I I was pretty much a wide open book. I really wasn't sure. That's, that's great. And to have that awareness that, you know, because sometimes saying, I'm not sure it's okay. And I think I totally agree with you. I think when we put this pressure at such an early age on our kids, like what you want to be when you grow up, why, Uh like we plant it so deep that, that then you cannot, I call it, well, my parents are Sicilian, so I, I've called it the Sicilian brainwash. (laughs) Oh, okay. Makes sense. Yes, because they were, they are excellent parents, but you know, they're very set in the, in the social standards. So they found their way to brainwash us in, in a few things. And I said it in a different episode, but I wanted to study law. I ended up studying business, like totally different. But now I got to the point where I see why my dad kind of pushes in, into a direction and to be grateful for it. Right. Uh, but you always wonder. And so probably me doing this podcast is my way of uh, externalizing that need that I had towards more of the, of the arts and, and, and that kind of career. So it's uh, fascinating that, that you mentioned that. Very much so. And I think that it gives us an outlet to fill ourselves up. I talk about uh, self fulfillment a lot. And early on when I was in my mid twenties, probably I was, what am I passionate about? What do I love? And I went to a retreat and it talked about the little P or the big P of passion, what you're passionate about, how you find your passion. And the overall weekend retreat came back and it was really about finding the little P's in everyday life. So find the little things that you're passionate about being that good friend or that good mother or, um, having that positive, saying that you give to someone else. And it's finding all those little peas in life that you put together to find your big passion. And so that really changed how I looked at everything because I was struggling to find who I am, who, what's my passion? What do I want to do? Where do I want to be? How, what kind of a mother can I, can I turn out to be in a wife? And it, it really wasn't about that at all. It was learning to enjoy and be, focus on the small things and the things that I had control of right then at that moment. 
Mm, interesting. So you, you end up doing some TV, some journalism for what you just said. And then what happened? Yes. And so my first job right out of college actually was uh, working for U.S. Cellular. It was a Dobson uh, division and they were out of Oklahoma City. They sold cellular services. And this was in the late 90s, 98, 99 time frame. We're in rural uh, northwestern Oklahoma. And so I did that uh, for probably eight months. And my job was actually direct sales. I found out very quickly that direct sales is not actually what I'm good at. I'm good at uh, working with people and networking, but actually having to sell you a product and uh, meet that goal every week wasn't something I was good at. So I stayed in that job for about, like I said, eight months or so. And then I took a position as a social worker, which was very out of the box, but you just needed a college degree to be a social worker in Oklahoma. So I worked for the state uh, for about a year and I actually started my master's in social work and I thought I was going to be a licensed clinical social worker. Um, but about that time, I met my ex-husband and we got married and I temporarily stopped my master's degree. We went overseas. He was in the Air Force. And so we were in South Korea and we spent a year over there. And uh, I ended up changing when I came back stateside to a uh, master's in business administration to an MBA. So it's uh, kind of a, a curvy course of how I got where I did. But I definitely think it fits who I am because I'm very flexible. I like to change course if I need to, and I'm not a afraid to do that. And I think that helps me as an entrepreneur uh, to be able to make the changes as I'm moving forward. Um, I may not go with option A or B, but I might have to do C or D. And I think that is something that I've had to learn along the way because I wasn't always comfortable with change. But now I have, uh, I'm pretty confident and flexible and I enjoy learning new skills and I see a challenge as an opportunity. So I think that has really helped me along the way. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think that's probably when, when we spoke, that's where in one of the things we probably connected because you realize when you talk to people that are very squared and they're set and there's nothing wrong with it because they might be happy and fulfilled, but the truth is life, you don't know what life is going to hand you. That's and right. so if you're not willing to change and adapt and be flexible, unfortunately, by the nature, nature of being a human being, and, and it, it, you know, life is going to throw you a curve at one point or the other. And uh, a lot of curves. A yes. lot of we, curves. We've got to know what to do with them and just go with it. I always look at it as a journey. And if I can enjoy the journey, then that's a positive thing. Absolutely. And then you went from a little town to South Korea. I'm a little curious about that part. <laughs> how was, if you can briefly say, how what, what was your biggest takeaway of changing your culture so drastically for over a year? I loved it, actually. And it was an eye opener. I think uh, having the opportunity to be immersed in another culture, another language, provided me with a different view of life. And it really opened up what life means and who I am as a person. I did work um, with the little children. So I was an English teacher initially. And then 9-11 happened um, when we were over there. And so I became a assistant on the military installation. They had some some need there. So I filled in where I could. And it was really an opportunity to see a country that I would have, I that wasn't on my bucket list to go to South Korea, but I fell in love with the country and the culture and the people. And the experience was, was just phenomenal. Actually, my two oldest children are adopted from South Korea. So we oh. really, yeah, we really did uh, love everything about it. Wow. And, and did you adopt them while you were there or it was after you came back? It was after we came back. And the interesting aspect was we had said we would we wanted to adopt when we were in South Korea. But the Korean government has a requirement of being married for three years. And we had just gotten married. So we said, well, 
we'll have biological kids and then we'll adopt after our three years of marriage. And that just wasn't the plan. So all of my children, as you know, are adopted and our plan had to alter course and things had to be changed. Wow, but I find it fascinating that you kind of knew you wanted to adopt even before, I, I take it, if the four of them are adopted, you were through some fertility issues? Oh, yes. We went through several different issues. Uh, we did in vitro fertilization four times. We did embryo transfers twice. Um, there was both male factor infertility as well as myself. I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so there were multiple different things uh, going on. And, and we tried, you know, the regular course and it just wasn't what God's plan was for us. Wow. But, uh, you know, it's very admirable. I have other friends that have uh, adopted kids and it's just such a uh, admirable, loving gesture. I always said that if God didn't give me my own children, you know, I have some friends that say, if we don't find the right boyfriend, I would just have a kid. And I could never, I cannot just get people that will put a child in the world just because they need to be a parent or a mother. And rather than help some kid that maybe doesn't have a family and just go and adopt a kid that it's already in this world, um, right. But I think it's 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 such a, a, a an amazing journey. And the fact that you kind of knew you wanted to adopt, even if God would have given you your own, that that's amazing. Right. And it was very it was surreal because uh, one of the things that I always wanted to be was a mom. And normally you're a mom through the traditional way you get married, you have kids. That's just the way that it is. And I learned very early on this was probably early 2002, 2001, 2002, I don't get to make those choices. I don't have control over everything. And so I went to counseling and my ex-husband and I went together and we worked through that grieving process. And it is, it's a loss of opportunity, a loss of actually going through a pregnancy and having that experience. But we were able to see the positive aspects and our children were literally, we always say this, were sent to us from God. God knew who our children should be before we found them. And the way we were matched with each of them is an amazing story. And that's a whole other podcast, probably. Okay, no, that's great. That definitely we, we will do one on, 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 on the journey to adoption or something like that, that, that I think would be very inspiring for, for our audience. That's great. But so you, you, you adopted two from South Korea and then the other two? We adopted them domestically, and we decided that uh, South Korea had changed some of the regulations, and so the children were about 18 months old before they actually were united with their forever family. So our oldest two were seven months old when we got them, which is still young enough that there's not a lot of transitional issues. So 18 months, though, they're learning to talk and walk and it's pretty traumatic for the children. So we decided to look at domestic adoption and that's where we adopted our two youngest ones. Wow. That's, that's great. And they are, what are the ages? Seven, nine, 14 and 16. So they keep us busy. You definitely have your hands full. <laughs> So I do. And I know you are very successful professionally. So that's what I want to go back and, and also talk a little bit on, you know, life uh, and balance with a professional, you know, you're the CEO of your own company. So you came back, you did an MBA in business. Yes. And I actually worked um, for Hewlett Packard at that time. And so I was a sales director there and they put me through phenomenal relational sales training, which was different than what I had done before. It was more transactional. And so I really learned how to be comfortable in the sales arena when I was working with Hewlett Packard. They also paid for my master's degree. So That's I great. got my MBA and uh, it was in 2005 when the general manager of RSI came back and uh, said, hey, would you be interested in coming back to work for us? We have a sales director opening and that's what you've been doing. About that time, my ex-husband was medically discharged from the Air Force. So we had the opportunity to go wherever we wanted. Um, I told them, I said, yeah, I'll try it for six months. And this was back in 2005. So I guess it 
I guess it worked out okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. And so you, they took you to this journey and uh, so you went up the ladder basically because then I you did. ended up becoming the CEO. What did it take? A lot of yeah, work. A lot of work. And, you know, starting out in uh, sales and marketing, I think it, it's easy to make those relationships. And the way I connect with people, it's not about what I can sell you. It's about who you are as a person. I actually enjoy talking to people, finding out about their kids and their families and their life and their story. And I think that makes a uh, immediate connection, which also grows into a business relationship. And so I actually was the sales and marketing manager. And then I went up to the vice president and then I took over the company about four years ago. And now I own a large portion of the organization too. So it's been a, definitely a process. It's a lot of work. People say, oh, you work for yourself. Well, you have a lot of flexibility. Somewhat I do, but it's a lot of hours. You know, um, the great part about it is I see my organization as an extended family. So I'm flexible with my staff as well. So we, this summer we had children in our office a couple couple of mine would come in. Our office administrator's daughter was in here. We have dogs that come in and we really just want to make it an enjoyable place to work. And I don't measure how many hours you work. I measure what you're actually getting done and what you achieve. So I may work early or I may work you know, after hours, after I go see one of my kids' events and I'm able to get what I need to get done because of that. And I think that's really an important aspect for any type of business is being able to have some sort of autonomy and flexibility in how you work. And I, that's one of the things that I really enjoy. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and this really comes with, uh, you know, being a woman, a mom and, and, and a high level executive is we have to find a way to make things happen. And, right. uh, and uh, sometimes I even have my kids, teachers sometimes tell me, as uh, in astonishment, like, how do you keep track of all? Because, you know, at school, and I have only two kids, but they have a lot. Yeah, you know, one day you have to bring an envelope. Today was picture right. day. So, and I was there and I was volunteering, as you know, because we, I, I gave you a heads yeah. up if we can, I start a little late, but this is a flexibility you're talking about. And I want to be present in my kids' um, life. And then you are, you're supposed to send an envelope telling them what kind of picture you want. I was really surprised to see how many kids didn't have the envelope. Mm. And, and yeah. it makes me a little sad, you know, because, it does. because, and, and there's people with very different circumstances, but you know, we are quite busy and, and, you know, I don't know, I, I cannot go to bed unless I know my kids have everything they need to be successful also in their environment. And, um, and so it, it gave me a little bit, it made me a little bit sad, you know, that there's a bunch of kids that, that for one reason or the other, and the teachers, they say, you know, how many times we, we don't get the parents, you know, involved right in what they're in their kids' life. And, uh, yeah, so that's something and that, that I know I strive for to, to be there, to be present and to know what's going on with them. It is critical. And I've noticed that even in our rural community. My kids have between 13 and 23 in their class. They're very small classes. And yet there is not as much parent involvement as I would expect. And don't get me wrong. I'm crazy busy this week. Next week I'm actually traveling. So I have a lot of family support. My parents take care of my kids. I have brothers and grandma and aunts and uncles, and they're going to step in and they'll help next week when I'm gone. But I have to juggle that. And as a parent, one of my biggest goals is to be that advocate for my children and to help them be successful in any way that they can. Both of my boys have ADHD or ADD. And so I've worked with the school to provide them with the tools that they need to be successful. Their brains just run so fast and they're so smart. We've got to be able to channel that energy in the appropriate way to help them be successful. And so I've really become an advocate for them. And then I look at other kids though, and I think, wow, how do they be successful if they don't have anyone helping them or, or showing them how to be successful? So Absolutely. there's, there's a lot of concern there. Absolutely. No. And, and, and a place to learn from, because I do see things and I say, I don't want my kids 
uh, to be, you know, the kids that don't have their things ready or uh, so, so that puts pressure on us mm -hmm. as a mom, as a, as a working mom. But I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, we have to keep our eyes uh, on the ball on, on that front. So I know we cover a lot of ground, but yeah. I, I said this at the beginning, and, and this is one of the things we also kind of connected when sh you shared with me, you were a cancer survivor. So life threw you a huge curve at some point in this story. And uh, so I want to know more about that. And, and what can you share about that experience? It was a shock. I don't have a family history of breast cancer, but... I found the lump myself and I said, okay, I'm 32 years old. I, it was on New Year's Eve. I said, oh, I guess I should go to the doctor and have this checked out. I really wasn't concerned because I didn't have a family history of breast cancer. And so I went in and had a mammogram and an ultrasound and they said, yeah, there's something there, but it's an infection. So let's take some antibiotics. And they sent me home and Six weeks later, I couldn't move my arm. My nine-year-old was seven months old at the time. I couldn't carry her. And I was actually at a trade show with Nate, the National Association of Tower Erectors in Oklahoma City. And I had a lot of people tell me, you've got to go get that checked out again. And so that Friday, I went back up and had an ultrasound, a mammogram, and a biopsy. And I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which is very aggressive usually strikes women that are younger. It's typically uh, related to the BRCA1 or BRCA gene, which I did later find out that I was a carrier and everything changes in, in a moment. It was shocking. At first I thought when they called me, I said, are you sure you need to recheck that biopsy? Because how is this possible? This doesn't happen. It happens to other people, not me. And I had a lot of people in my church community. And of course, locally, it's a big village. So I appreciate that everybody's involved now. I uh, had people sign up to bring me food three days a week for my family. I didn't need it. I was in chemo treatment, so I couldn't eat. Uh, but it, to help my family to make sure that they were taken care of so I could focus on getting better. And I went through 16 chemo treatments. I had a double mastectomy reconstruction and a hysterectomy because the BRCA1 gene is the same gene for ovarian cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. And I wanted to be preventative. So a lot of times you don't see full circle, but my adoption journey already allowed me to grieve the loss of a pregnancy. And I told them, I said, take out my ovaries. I'm not having any more children. They tell me you're 33. You're going to have more children. No, my kids are adopted. I don't need to worry about it. So I can be very aggressive. And that was a blessing to really be able to not have to deal with that on top of everything else where and I was just trying to Everything happens survive. for a reason. I mean, you, you say very that story much. and I say, wow, yeah, maybe, maybe if you could have had children, you wouldn't have made that decision. And maybe down the road, you would be at a bigger risk. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. And so I, you know, going through cancer, you really put things in focus. And I've tried to be a positive person and look at the positive side. But when you're fighting for your life, and that is truly what I was doing, it's all relative. I actually have on my wall right now, uh, I have an inspiration wall. And right next to my phone, it says, at least it's not cancer. And that is what I measure everything against. Well, it's not cancer. So it's really probably not that big of a deal. It's not going to kill me. I'll survive. I'll course correct and, and we'll make it through. And even having cancer, it was a blessing because I had the financial means and I had the insurance and I had the ability to get treatment at MD Anderson, which is the world's best cancer treatment center in Houston. Um, a lot of people that I encountered didn't have that opportunity. So even going through something as tragic and as life-changing as that, you either decide to be happy or you decide to be sad. And for me, I chose to be happy. I chose to get up every day. I actually very rarely missed work. I would have a chemo treatment and be at work at the next day. Now, there were days I had to go home because I literally couldn't move, but 
I tried to keep my life as normal as I could. And I think that really helped me throughout the process and, and the struggle that I faced and just making the choice to be happy and positive and being counting those blessings that I had, having that opportunity and the family support and the career that allowed me to have flexibility. I was uh, still in sales management at that point. And so I could work remotely and do the things that I needed to do. But I also had a great team here and they could keep going without me. And it really helped me with my business, too, and understanding that everyone's replaceable and your job will continue to go on. But what really matters is the family and that community that you have. So it changes things when you have a, a life threatening circumstance such as that. Wow. What a story. Very, very admirable. And, you know, I have a very good friend. Actually, she underwent the double mastectomy yesterday. Oh, okay. And uh, she did have the, the BRAC gene. So she, she wasn't diagnosed with, with uh, breast cancer. She basically has two very small kids and they found the gene, the double whammy, like uh, two genes. Right. I don't know, like her risk it was very high. And I admire the decision she made because, you know, it's, you don't know how you're going to, what kind of decision you would make if, if you were told that, but you don't have breast cancer right now, you're healthy. Exactly. Um, and I have a story on that. Um, one of the girls that I work with, Brenda Meyer, she's the sales manager here now. She was diagnosed with the BRCA gene year, uh, probably five or six years before I was. And it was relatively new then. And people didn't know about the likelihood, I think it's like an 80 some percent chance that you're going to have breast cancer. And so they told her she needed a double mastectomy and a hysterectomy. And she chose to have the hysterectomy because it sounded so radical to have a double mastectomy when you don't have cancer. Um, I went through treatments and her and I are really good friends and we were discussing it. And I said, you know, go ahead and get the mastectomy. That was the easy part. The chemo and the radiation and all the other things were the difficult part. And she was going in to get a double mastectomy and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So wow. it was, yeah, it was very shocking. And of course I was able to help her through it and she had seen me go through it the year before. And so we shared resources and things, but it was, yeah, definitely you don't know how you're going to react until you are faced with that situation. And people always say, how do you get through it? Well, when you don't have a choice, you just figure it out. Well, <laughs> but but what knowing what do. you know now, what do you, do you think you have an opinion? Like, would you do what my friend just did? And yes, go, definitely. A hundred percent. I would. Yeah. Because I think this is valuable for anybody out there listening to this, that, you know, someone that went through, you know, the, the, uh, sad experience, sad and difficult experience of, of being diagnosed and someone not being diagnosed, but knowing that the risk is so high. Yes, that I uh, would definitely do it. And I suggest everyone take whatever opportunities that you can for your health, because if you don't have your health, you have nothing. You can't work. You can't be there for your kids. You can't help other people. If you are not healthy and you can't physically do things, you're not who you want to be. So I say do anything you can. And I'm a huge advocate for taking those what some people see as radical options, but be, be very aggressive. No, thank you. And that, that's even, you know, I have mine set up for in two weeks. So, uh, Good. normally every time you go, you, you know, it's all, it's impossible not to be nervous, right? That oh, you go, definitely. you have to go through it. But, but then the other amazing thing it's to, that you channel all these positive things and you have involved, you got involved with a, a very interesting uh, initiative back in Kiowa, right? Where you live, is this where you live? Yes, I do. And uh, you help transform a former hospital into a pink beacon of hope for yes. expectant mothers in need. We did. And it is called Project Pink House. Uh, my fellow breast cancer survivor and I put this together and our goal is to provide women with resources and a community uh, to break the cycle of poverty and to empower them to be all that they can be. I know, like I said, the most important thing for me was that community, the family support that I have, but not everyone has those opportunities. And so we put together Project Pink House and we brought in women 
uh, women with children, women that were pregnant, uh, provided them with a safe place to live and really to be able to focus on their growth and who they can become to be the best parent or person that they can be. And it was a calling, I would say. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it because it's definitely a huge undertaking. But we jumped out in 2015 and we've helped uh, multiple women. We're temporarily closed right now. We've had some flooding going on in our area. So we're trying to remedy those issues. But it's definitely something that I love to do. I love to mentor and coach others. Um, that's how Women of Nate was actually formed is there was a couple of us that got together and we wanted to impact women within our industry. And so we put together Women of Nate and that's how the mentoring program was put together. Ah, and I didn't know this, but I'm a mentor not seen for a few months back. So I'm part of something you helped create. So that's thank great. you. That's <laughs> great. Exciting. So thank you. And no, no, that's uh, exciting that, you know, there's uh, leadership and vision uh, such as yours. In the, I'm lucky because in the industry, we have to support women. I don't know if there's anything on that front uh, that you want to share, anything on diversity, anything on struggling in a, in a male dominated industry. Any thoughts on that? It is definitely interesting. And I think uh, you can choose how you utilize the experiences that you have. And so I typically, uh, when I'm a, I'm a subject matter expert on radio frequency radiation, which yes, sounds dull, but it can be fun if, if you can train appropriately and make it fun. But when I walk into a room, typically if I'm with a male counterpart, they're going to my male counterpart and asking questions people are and not to me. And it's an unconscious bias, I think, that we so many times have. I've even noticed myself do things like this. And so I try to be conscious and, and focus on what I'm here for. And I'm not here to necessarily get any type of glory. I'm here to do my job and train people. And then in the end, though, they realize that I am competent, I'm qualified, I understand and I have the experience necessary to meet their goals. And then things come full circle and I see changes in faces and they're thinking, "Uh oh, I asked her to get me coffee or whatever <laughs> it might be. <laughs> so it's definitely been an interesting journey. Like I said, I work with the military. I worked in Eula Packard, which is IT based. And so most of my professional career has been in male dominated industries and I'm pretty comfortable in that aspect. But I did learn initially, I didn't have a lot of mentors. And so I thought I needed to be strong and tough and uh, not show my emotional intelligence or be friends with people or be nice. And I realized probably about, oh, three, oh, five timeframe, be nice is actually who I am. And it's hard for me to be that cutthroat person. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm competitive. I want to be the best speaker or the best trainer or, or the best board member that I can be. But I also care about people. And so that's, something that I changed in myself and my attitude. I decided to focus on the positives and be happy and be nice because there's a lot of people that maybe are not nice or not having a good time. And if I can be nice to them and make them smile, that can maybe change their whole day. And so I've actually changed who I am and been able to be successful doing that by being myself and actually caring about people and, and having that relationship. And that's a little bit different because a lot of times the men don't necessarily have that personal communication and that personal relationship with others. So I think it makes us memorable. I think it actually gives us an edge in the male dominated industries. If we utilize what women are typically known for, which is our compassion and our caring and our understanding of others. Wow, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, feedback on, you know, on, on a industry that we share. Yes. And because I'm also in telecom and it's, it's been an interesting ride on my, on my, my view on it is like you, I've been trying to focus on, on my thing and never to either leverage 
one way or the other, the fact that uh, we are women in a male-dominated industry. I do feel that at this time, there's so much focus on, on diversity and inclusion that without doing anything different, like maybe we're given opportunities that we weren't given in the past. This is oh, definitely. Like, like now it's like I get emails about doing this or doing that. And I'm like, this never happened before. I don't know if I'm getting old and maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm like earning it more or what. But I definitely see that we have a different kind of platform that we had a few years back. And I think that's great for us because in the past, like you said, there maybe wasn't as much opportunity. And I think our industry needs a lot more of this diversity and inclusion. I speak about generational inclusion and diversity, and I've actually been on several different panels um, and spoke about this because that's one of the things we have our boomers and our millennials working together. And we do a lot of things differently, but we do a lot of things the same. We all want respect. We want to be valued. We want to understand what our impact is in the job that we offer to our companies. And so I've really actually focused a lot on learning about diversity and inclusion as a result of my own company. I took over the CEO position and I had about 200 years of knowledge retire And I'm trying to struggle and figure out what am I going to do with 200 years of knowledge that just retired? How do I make sure my company is still top notch and we have the expertise that we need? Because with that type of knowledge, you just can't train people on it. And so I had to start learning about succession planning and knowledge capture and knowledge transfer within organizations, literally to keep RSI going. And as such, I just figured out that I really enjoy that. And that's kind of a secondary passion that I have. Radio frequency radiation safety pays the bills, but I actually love leadership and leadership management and coaching training. So I was able to find that along the way, but out of necessity for the company that I run. Well, but it sounds, uh, it sounds like a great uh, either transition or a great thing that you found true passion, uh, doing what you do to pay the bills. <laughs> because exactly. Now, most people don't find their passion because they're afraid of stop doing what pays the bills and they don't find the courage within themselves to believe in themselves and saying, I can do this. I can make a living out of what I like. And so that that's uh, very inspirational. So as we get to the end of the of the interview, and, and you've been great guest, by the way, because normally sometimes I get to this point and I, I don't know what makes the person tick. You share many <laughs> things that you're passionate about and I can feel the excitement in your voice. But if there's anything that particular that you haven't shared, that it, you, you, it, feel, it makes you feel butterflies when you do it and you say, this is what I'm meant to do, what would it be? I think it's just to empower and inspire others. I always say you have to live the life you love and love the life you live. And don't wait till tomorrow to be happy. Be happy now because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. And so when I go to bed, I know that I have given this life and this day all that I can give it. And I've had a lot of great things happen to me and I count my blessings along the way. So just being able to say that every day is what makes me tick and what makes me get up and see what the next opportunity will be. Well, I definitely think you have the life stories to back up any motivational, you know, I feel <laughs> empowered and, and, and inspired by, by this conversation and learning more about you and, and all the things you've done and achieve. Uh, I admire what you've done. Uh, both professionally and personally. I said that at the beginning, but now even more so. <laughs> so you. I definitely will share all the links uh, and the show notes for anybody listening to this and Miranda's uh, contact info. She's very open to have a side conversation with anybody. Definitely. And I really thank you, Miranda. I wish you the best of luck and thank you so much for being part of Back to Basics. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting and I'm Excited to hear the rest of your guests speak as well. well thank you so much. Have Bye. a good day. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye. And until the next time. Bye.